think the reason that we do the long-term future is not to get it right. It's because that, as I said, gives us the opportunity for real transformational and interesting change. I think we're pretty good at short-term forecasting, frankly. I don't think that, you know, the economists do good for you know a year, 18 months ahead. They're pretty good. I'll show you. Yeah, five to ten. Now you're into the possibility of really transformational change in some domains, and therefore, you, and, the, and then the uncertainty becomes dominant. And it's, it's yes, sir. This gentleman's question about using forecasting in his business. Right. There is some thought, apparently, that the electrical car, when it comes in the next few years, yep. may be the last of the cars before there's a transformation into a different type of mass transit. Um, <laughs> transit, yeah. whatever right. it is, for yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, how would we go about looking at that, and how would we go about creating a time frame? Yeah. Well, we just finished transportation, so let me give you two and a half minutes on that. Um, <laughs> the, as, as, a, as a case, the personal transportation vehicle provides benefits to people that mass transit has had not. The mass transit developed in an age when people lived either close to or along mass transit lines, and that was what now we call transmarine development. Well, that goes back to the 1870s, you know, when we first started build railroads and subways and things like that. So, uh, and people didn't have the need to jump around in places like Houston and Atlanta and LA and Phoenix and here to there. Now that we have created urban settlements called cities, metropolitan areas, where stuff is not so concentrated, is not dense, it's not along the transportation corridors, the personal vehicle is an absolute necessity. I mean, I had a student once a graduate who actually didn't have a car, and everybody thought he was crazy. <laughs> he kind of took it as a, you know, as a thing. But nevertheless, so it's very, very difficult. One of two things will happen. Either we will, create, we will maintain a personal transportation vehicle, supplemented and, 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 and complemented by all kinds of other devices, <laughs> or we will have to transform the form of the urban settlement to make into it, you know, so I can get my job, I can get my life done, shopping and work and kids and school and all of that around that. Now, that is a massive re redevelopment of cities like Houston and Phoenix and LA, which you could develop scenarios around that and how that might happen. To, to do that as a futurist, you would say, okay, let's assume the continuation of personal transportation in some form. I don't care if you got little gerbils running you know, in the motor place, it's some form. Or there is no power source that really works economically, feasibly, technologically, environmentally, then what is the alternative? Then you have to paint the scenario in a compelling way that people will say, okay, we're not making a prediction. We're not saying this will happen, but we are painting a picture of a plausible alternative future. And that's the futurist contribution, is that today, in 2008, we don't have to make that decision. What we have to do is paint the all plausible alternative futures so that people who are making decisions are making decisions in light of all of those futures, not the one where they're making an assumption that it has to be one or the other. So in, in very brief, that's how a futurist answers that question. Now, the problem is I didn't give you an answer. Because <laughs> there is no answer. Because the future is multiple. It's not yet determined. We don't know enough. Uncertainty dominates. And that is the core of future studies. And that's what I didn't get when I first signed on. That's why I wrote that little paper. I wish I still had that little paper. I should put it on the internet and say, see how stupid sociologists could be? That's the core. And that's what you should really take away from this and the World Future Society and all of your work. The uncertainty dominates. So most people, when uncertainty dominates, they basically throw up their hands and say, don't know. You can't tell. No, you know, might as well not think about it. We say, no, no. Here's a technique. For, for handling it, but you have to go down each path far enough to where it becomes really clear what that path is and how that path might evolve in a set of plausible causal elements. This is not science fiction. The difference between future studies, scenario planning, scenario development, and science fiction is that science fiction does not have to be connected to the present. There are science fiction authors who start from the present and work their way forward, but you don't have to. Star Trek, you had no idea how this Federation thing got started. Star Wars had no idea how the Empire was formed. Any, any science fiction, most science fiction, just starts in the future. 
in scenario development, we have the requirements. You can't just put it out there. You also have to have a plausible path to do that. Because we're not talking about literature and fiction, though there are a lot of elements of the same. We are talking about getting, you know, getting from here to there. So how you handle the future of personal transportation or trans mobility within a metropolitan environment is exactly that way. We develop clear, distinct, compelling scenarios about how each of those can. Um, about 10 years ago, the administrator at, at, uh, at NASA came up with the new values for NASA. And they were better, cheaper, faster. Hmm. Kind of a joke today. They didn't realize that you can't get all three at the same time. You can get two at most, maybe one. You certainly didn't get cheaper. <laughs> And, you know, whatever. So I thought, well, that sounds like a great thing. What are the three things that futurists need to have? And I came up with my three things. I hope they're not as big a joke in the future. As, and it's wider, deeper, and longer. We think more, we, we, we gather, and we, just like the guy on the lookout on the, on the ship, there is nothing in society that we say is off the table. Now, what we give up for that is specificity about any of those things. So an economist will always tell you more about the economy. A scientist will tell you more about technology, et cetera, et cetera, than we ever will know. But what they don't do is connect the dots. They don't give that big picture. So more what, what, wider. Deeper is all about challenging assumptions. Our view of the future, our approach to the future, is built upon assumptions, beliefs that we have about what's possible, what's plausible, how things work, how people are, how society is, how things work. And those assumptions oftentimes get us into trouble because they are, there are alternatives which end up being more true. And therefore, so we challenge. And then longer. And we've already talked about that. The long term future, not such the change, but the so what of the change and the implications of the change and the second, third, and fourth order consequences of the change. So remember those three things wider, deeper, longer. So let's talk about wider. There is a, a three level environment that I talk about, and I already mentioned in an enterprise is a person, or a small group, or a family, or a community, or in the human society as a whole. And that enterprise has a, an immediate environment. In business, it's the business environment. And, uh, Alan, uh, Michael Porter, for those of you that do strategic planning, is an expert on this. His model for the transactional business environment is almost canonical in strategic planning. <laughs> Customers, suppliers, regulators, technologies, et cetera, et cetera, competitors, all that kind of stuff. And frankly, the, the enterprise, the people in the enterprise know that transactional environment better than any futurist does unless they're really, really a, a, an expert in it. So we, we let them do the future of that. The part that we do is what we call the steep categories, S-T-E-P, social, technological, economic, environmental, political. You will find at least a half a dozen, if not a dozen different versions of that. And I have my own version up here. The reason we call it steep is because it's the only one we know how to pronounce. <laughs> so it has to be pronounceable as an acronym. And it's a nice, you know, handy checklist. What are the E's? Huh? What are the E's? The economic and environmental. It goes around the it goes around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think social is a little bit too broad and it has two distinct categories: the demographic, which is population statistics, characteristics change, and then cultural, <coughs> the values and norms and things like that. So what we we claim that because we're on the top of the mass, looking out on this broad thing, that we know more about what goes on there than the people in the enterprise do. Now, those people are not stupid. They're awake. They're listening. They listen to the news. But our specialty is seeing that whole big picture and then telling them, oh, this is going to come and change your transactional environment. And that transactional environment is going to come and change your enterprise <coughs> and, the, and the enterprise of your competitors and technologies and things like that. Now, the reason that that's hard a hard sell is that it's not going to do it right away. There's the stuff out there, climate change, for all the, I mean, I think, personally, I think we're on the high curve of climate change. I think, you know, we, I mean, as much as we've been pushing it, oh, catastrophe, you know, the world's, I mean, frankly, see, I went through all this in the 1970s. We thought, that, you know, the world was coming to an end, and it didn't. And were we embarrassed? Okay, and I think this time it's a lot more serious, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. And so, uh, uh, I think there could be, in a couple of three years, another disappointment factor. Well, I guess, you know, I guess it wasn't real, even though it's going to keep going on. Remember, that underlying curve is going to keep going. So we're the ones who are trying to say, this is changing out there, and it's not going to change you this week, this month, this year, 
But in a couple, three, five years, guess what? You are going to be living in a different world. And all we can have to do is point to the changes that they're dealing with today. And we say, did those start yesterday, last week, last month? No. They all start a couple of years ago, if not decades ago. And we laid in the seeds. I mean, talk about this personal transportation thing. The fact that we have that in the United States, oil as, as available and inexpensive as it's been, had us, as good rational beings we are, dependent on that energy source and that technology that grew up around it. And literally, we built cities of 5 million people around the assumption that that was there. Not that we should, maybe should have done anything differently. I'm not arguing that. But that started 50 years ago. I mean, General Motors, we know, actually had a policy in the 1930s and the 40s to dismantle the mass transportation systems in the cities as a way of opening up the, the way for the interstates and the automobile and things like that. So this was a long, long-term global change that then has come to be, give us the life and the form that we have today. So now I have a particular, it's in your book here, a particular way that I say this. People uh, use technology. People basically live in a habitat. And they use technology. So this is people in the, in the physical environment. They use technology to produce goods and services under a system, whether it's capitalism or communism or feudalism or whatever, to produce goods and services within a matrix of collective decisions by some kind of an authority, whether it's the king or the Politburo or the Congress or whatever, and in a final matrix of culture, values, language, beliefs, norms, etc., etc. So this is my checklist when I when I go about looking at the future of transportation. In fact, the very first step when we did the future of transportation, we had uh, had the project manager and four graduate students, and each. Each student had two of these domains that they had to look for. Now, they weren't just looking for the, trans the demographics of transformation. They were looking at the demographics of everything. And then we brought it back in. So our first step is to say, what's going on in the world? And then to focus it on the transactional environment. So that's kind of how we, uh, how we go about implementing the wider. And what we're looking for in the wider is surprise. Being surprised is something we pay for. You know, you go to the fun house in the, in the park or the horror show and something jumps out, you know, the dark corridor. I hate those things, you know. All of that. And we go, oh, I'm scared, you know, all that. And we would have somehow pleasurable, I don't know. <laughs> but being surprised at work, not so. Being surprised in your, you know, in your pig slip or when gasoline is for, I mean, people are running around being surprised at $4 a gallon gasoline. The only surprise the future has had is it took so long to happen. You know, the fact that, you know, this is happening is absolutely, is totally exactly what was expected. We just expected it 10 years ago. So now it's happening and everybody's surprised. But how you protect yourself against surprise is by taking it a little bit at a time. It's like a vaccine. You know, we take a little bit of the vaccine to protect ourselves against the real disease because the real disease is smash. Going on, going on, going on, assuming that things are the same, and then all of a sudden they change and we are surprised in a big way. We smash into the wall. So, yes. what indicators did you see 10 years ago that made you think that uh, gasoline would be $4? Um, well, the increasing foreign, I mean, OPEC, well, I mean, Okay, 10 years ago. Come to I mean, Australia, it's about eight. Excuse me? I said, come to Australia, it's about eight dollars a gallon. <laughs> well, no, the U.S. is still cheaper than any place in the world, but. No, I'm just curious. Like, that uh, it, it, like, it, like, what, what shall I say? The, the price it was elsewhere in the world was an indicator. Uh, the fact that we were becoming more concentrated, uh, getting more. Um, Oil from more restricted number of sources, obviously increasing dependence on foreign sources. Was peak oil considered the uh, peak oil really? Sales? Peak oil. Well, uh, King Hubbard did his peak oil prediction for the U.S. in 1957. One of the few predictions that, that came out, I mean, dead on. He called it within one year. Peak oil production in the U.S. was 1970. Call that 13 years ahead. People were talking about peak oil then. It wasn't as serious a scenario as it is today. So there was that kind of discussion. And the fact that, that this was, a, even though the 1980s, the reason that the 70s, the, the sky didn't cave in, is that in the 1980s, they found enormous quantities of oil in the 
Alaska, in the North Sea, in Nigeria, in the Gulf of Mexico, and that was totally unexpected, number one, because we thought it was over. And in fact, it was about the fifth time that that had happened when they had started selling gasoline for Shell Oil Company in 1939. They thought they were going to run out of oil by 1945. You know, so it, it, it goes through these cycles. And frankly, this may be just another cycle. Maybe we will find this enormous, you know, elephant field off Brazil or, or open up the North Slope and all that kind of stuff. So that, the, those indicators were that sooner or later, this finite resource was going to become expensive. So it was more or less a general thing. Yes. Years ago, also, you were starting to see instability in some of the nations that we got our oil from. Well, and yeah, that made it increasingly politically difficult and all that. Yes, ma'am. I also have a point on plucking on the community in the arts. If you remember back in the 70s, the movie Three Days of the Condor. Right. Um, when um, Robert Redford at the Virgin Act, and he was a reader for the intelligence. Mm -hmm. Great. And found the fire. Right, right. Uh, and, and that's two slides away. <laughs> Great, good deal. So let me, let me say that, that the recommendation is looking to be surprised, reading to be surprised, reading to be wrong, reading, looking for things that says, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand that. That doesn't fit my pattern. And in each of those cases, you are immunizing yourself against the fundamental surprise, which is the big transformation that comes over the world. So it's, as I said, the kind of immunization. So scanning hits is what we call them. These are either events or, or new information that could change the future. And it's a very it's very specific. Scanning is something futurists use. Futurists have adopted the term scanning to mean any time they go and do research. Well, I respect they use that. I don't. To me, scanning is a very specific thing. What has just happened that could change the future? Some people call it weak signals. And the trick is that they're weak. And the trick is that they haven't changed the future yet and convincing people that that little thing, that little piece of information, that movie even, that book, is actually telling us something about the future. We had weak signals about 9-11 all the way along. We only realized they were weak signals after the event, right? And we, and because terrorism was not new, I mean, we had Munich, we had airplane hijackings through, and ship hijackings throughout the 60s and 70s. It's just that the problem with weak signals about terrorism is that there are weak signals about everything. There's hundreds of them. So if this person thinks this is going to be a weak signal, this is a weak signal, we really only know that they are weak signals after the event and the discontinuity occurs and we go, oh, how stupid were we when we were paying attention? We were paying attention to lots of things. And there is a human tendency to filter and basically deal with the complexity of the future by ignoring most of it. So you, know, you, can't, you can't possibly track everything, but I believe we could pay more attention to these kind of scanning hits than, than yes. One recent scanning, one thing that I saw scanning was there's a little company in Texas, a venture capital, that's got finally been done putting money in. Mm -hmm. And what they invented is a battery that's a paper battery wow. that will, and you can plug it up, it recharges in five minutes, and you can go 500 miles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a new technology. Now, how many times have we heard a press release, oh, this is, you know, this technology, hype cycle, blah, blah, blah. But once in a while, those things actually do transform the future. So they didn't want it, though. It was only that they were the folks who were watching the venture capitalists right. who saw it. Uh, Barbara, did you want to? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. The segue is a perfect example. Segue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just the whole idea that it was going to transform yeah, the was, it was gonna, You know, they, they, they the were pretty smart people. I don't know whether they, how much they paid them to say that, but they said, oh, the whole new form of urban transportation. So we, get, we become, I mean, we feel foolish because, oh, it didn't turn out. The picture tells us, oh my gosh, how much money did AT&T throw down in that hole that and never did. And the flying car, all that kind of stuff. Futurists can play for all those things. The fact that we were talking about the internet even before the internet was a name 15 years ahead of time, global warming, uh, price of oil, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't seem to get people's attention, you know, what you, what you did wrong. So, the scanning kits, three types, as, as the book says, 95% of all the scanning kits that you find are uh, confirming an existing underlying trend. So the existing underlying trend is that we're going to have to have new 
energy sources, so the paper battery or whatever, battery battery technology is one of those few technologies that people have been so surprised that it hasn't advanced very much. So there are now proposals on the table. The second kind of scanning kit is one that says one scenario is more likely than another. So a law or an action or a piece of information. Yes, sir. I don't want to get, get us too bogged down in the specifics, but I got to violently disagree with battery technology is not changing fast. The U.S. military is pumping in billions of dollars and getting lower cost, lighter weight batteries. What, all what, what and they're producing. Been, they're producing. What, in our what, lifetime, we've seen it. We've gone from lead acid to NICAD to uh, metal. Uh, so the lithium, lithium metal hybrid. Those are just small changes, but they're 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 getting a lot bigger and faster. They're getting into molecular level batteries and oh, I, nano batteries. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. So it's there's a lot of focus on it, and there is productivity coming. Out of it. It, yeah, it's changing. It just doesn't change as fast. It, the price performance curve is not nearly as steep as almost <coughs> any other technology that they've been pumping. Would you agree with that? What's the reason for that, though? Is it because the battery companies are making good? It's no, a problem. Problem. Because, because the military machine, with the soldier, carries a lot of kit on it. No, the reason that they want to do it, she's asking why they haven't succeeded as much as... I mean, when, you, when you compare batteries with chips or DRAM or, or, or bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, those have gone through the more orders of magnitude, more yeah. and batteries have not. That's but batteries are governed a bit, a bit less by the digital... Oh, it's uh, not digital, it's chemicals. That's right. It's a physical it's a property as opposed to a digital uh, it's a just progression. A tough, it's a tough problem. I'm not claiming that nobody's trying. My gosh, try, 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 try. I'd say trying and achieving. They're just not achieving at yeah, a digital slow. pace. It's yeah. Okay. So the so the scanning hit, the resolving determines one future. Is there going to be uh, a private personal transportation in the 10 to 20, 30 year environment or not? And and so a scanning hit that says, oh, we have this very efficient, lightweight fuel source that will move. Uh, yeah, Honda just came out with the, uh, you know, when you're the first person to know about the new Honda hydrogen car and, and the few stations in Southern California that are doing that. Now, the fact that that's all in the news now makes it less valuable. Everybody knows it. So our job as futurists, and your job to the extent that you want to do it, is to be in touch with those things before everybody finds out, bring that to people's attention, having them start factoring that stuff in. So that's what we're trying to do. The best kind of scanning kit, however, is that which creates new. One that really says, wow, I never thought things could be this way before. And those are very few and far between. I put these numbers on here just as they're kind of like, that's really the, that, that's the goal standard. When you come up with that. Uh, we had uh, a guy in, in our program long, 10 years ago or so from London, he came to Houston and studied with us for a year. Unbelievable scan. I mean, this guy was just so wired into everything. He told us about Napster. And, music downloading, peer-to-peer computing, nine months before it ever even got on any newspaper. You know, this, so that's the gold standard. Here's an alternative future that you want. So, but the, the, the reason is, I say the same thing, being surprised in little ways, little scanning kits, and, and, and most of them will not turn out to be true. It's not a question of, you know, people ask me, well, how, how accurate are you? You know, what's your batting average? Batting average is terrible. It's not the theories of social science or whatever. It is basically the assumptions that we uh, uh, that we make about the future that make it one or the other. I, I developed this chart uh, on the left hand side is what you might call traditional forecasting: the data, the model, the forecast, the assumptions, and then they get to the end and they say, "Okay, there's my forecast. I lead." Futurists generally go back then and say, "If that's our forecast, what are the assumptions?" The assumptions are much more important in the futures world than the forecast because we realize, number one, the forecasts are multiple, the futures are multiple, and that they're going to change anyway. I mean, by the time we get there, we're going to have other forecasts. So we don't so much think of the future as a set of forecasts, but we're continually trying to investigate how is it that we came to that? Why do we think that? What's the alternative of thinking? I teach a course in critical thinking, which is very much allied to in future studies because in critical thinking, you're always thinking about what might be true instead. What assumption am I making that, that has an alternative and that alternative might be true instead? And so when we're thinking of the future, here's what people expect to happen. What might, what, what might happen instead? And what assumption are they making versus the alternative? So the assumptions are, and, and frankly, assumptions are devilishly difficult 
to come to, to come to because, as I was explaining to somebody earlier during the break, the assumptions are what we use to shape our perception of the rest of the world. They're like our eyes. You can't see your eyes. You can't see your eyes just by standing. Try to look at your eye. You know, I'm using my eye to see you all, and you're using your eye to see me and the rest of you, but you can't see your eye unless you have a mirror. The same way, we can't see our assumptions. When I was in, when I, I was in undergraduate, I, was, I thought I was going to be a physicist, and we'd have physics lab. I hated writing up physics lab anymore, because they would always say, state your assumptions. Of course, I was a philosophy major, so I never knew where to stop. You know, was the, was the instrument calibrated correctly? Well, I don't know. Did the instrument really exist? Well, I really didn't know. Did I really exist? You know, did the lab? Oh, you know, it just, I didn't know where to stop. Okay, so I, I had a very early doubt with assumptions because there are so many of them and go on and on. All right. So where, how do we then deal with assumptions in future studies? There's two ways, very similar to the surprise thing. Either you will get your assumptions from other people, or you will get them from the world. The way we get them from other people is by hanging out, listening to, and appreciating the fact that people who disagree with us might actually have something to say. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And the teacher may appear in the form of somebody who looks absolutely, totally crazy. And what? You actually have a job and you think that? You know, you're a reasonable person and you think that? Well, then we say, wait a minute, maybe I'm the one who has got the mirror point of view. So how we do assumptions, you can do it in person, you can do it by reading, and exactly what Anna's talking about. Here's people of different, I make, I make my, my daughter, who's a very much even more liberal than I am, read conservative stuff. I say, read this. I ain't reading this stuff. Read it, because you need to understand how everybody is thinking. Okay, so we do that. The other way is the world teaches us what our assumptions are wrong. And when that happens, then you're in trouble. But then the world comes and says, you, you, you messed up because. So obviously, the preference is to hear other people and what their assumptions are so that we can understand. Not that we can agree with them, but they, they're like the mirror. They're the mirror. I can see my eye if I'm standing in front of the mirror. I can't see my eye if I'm just looking out at it. So they're the mirror that we test our assumptions against theirs. Because when there's a disagreement, there's usually not a disagreement about the data, about the information. I mean, you know where you live, and you know, blah, blah, blah. If you had a disagreement about your ranks, it is disagreeing over your estimate about the rest of the people in the room. That is where the disagreement, but if your estimate is wrong, their estimate is right, or at least you realize, and you can still choose your own. You don't have to agree with it. But at least you're choosing it in light of the fact that there may be some alternatives. Now, is that an, is that an endless process, a never-ending process? Yes. There is no way, because every assumption, every set of assumptions, even the assumption that there are alternative assumptions, is an assumption. For now, <laughs> way too philosophical. Here. Yes, John. It's a problem in either of the systems getting people to really state their assumptions. Well, because most people, most people, sure. right. most forecasts are made without even writing down what the real assumptions are. And, and there's two reasons for that. What, there are two reasons why people don't state their assumptions. What's one of those reasons? They don't know, they don't know what they are. Okay. You know, because his people would say, state your assumptions. And I'm going, you know, it's like the teacher saying, think about it. Oh, I forgot the thinking part. I'm sorry. That doesn't help me. State your assumptions. I don't know what they are. But even if they know what they are, there's another reason why they don't state it. Exactly. The weakness of the argument is in the assumptions, not in the data. So you don't want to give people the tools to say you're not true, you're not correct, because, and so if they don't think of your assumptions, then you're off. They believe you. I have all these statistics, blah, 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 here's the trend, blah, 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 blah. I don't state the fact, the assumption. How, I mean, there's, in, in, in doing trend extrapolation, I came across this amazing assumption. You know when people do trend extrapolation, you can do this in Excel, you know, do the trend thing. Get the data in, do the trend thing, you get a number, you can extrapolate it out, you know, 100 years if you want. Bingo. What people don't realize is that where you start the trend is an assumption. If you have a kind of a curvy line, and you have data going back to 1960, you can use the whole data set, and you're assuming that the trend is constant. Or you can say, oh, here was a discontinuity in 1974, we need to start there, and out of that we get a flat line. 
oh, in the last few years have been kind of a downtrend. Is that an aberration or is that a new trend? Those are assumptions. And therefore you get one increasing, one flat, and one declining future, even though, and how many people will tell you that? They won't, nobody will. They'll say, here's my, you know, here's my assumption. And they don't even say, here's my assumption. Here's the data. This is data. You've got to believe me. Wait a minute. Where are your assumptions? Well, statistics is used that way. Sure. It's John. <laughs> the animator, yes, okay. Now you know that you are in service to the dark side. <laughs> Trying to get people to believe things even though they're not thinking critically. Yes, sir. I'd say another thing about assumptions that's tricky is that our culture teaches us to try to accept some of our assumptions, not as assumptions, but as oh, oh, it's not. Oh, of course. You know, people are basically good. Or that, you know, we should believe, you know, everything the government says. Or that science is always right. Or blah, 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 capitalism is the only way of running a society. Blah, 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 blah. All of those are assumptions. And, and people who are going to try and persuade you, if they reveal their assumptions, will try and get you, need to have you, not only get you, but need to have you accept the assumption to accept the final argument. Because remember, the judgment, the conclusion, is data and assumptions. It always involves both. And, and in my sense, every communication, even a scientific paper, is, an, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a persuasion. I mean, if somebody publishes something in Science Magazine, American Association for the Advancement of Science, most prestigious science journal in the world, nature, whatever, they are trying to win the Nobel Prize. They are trying to put themselves in, in good light, in light of their colleagues and their and, and so they're trying to persuade you that the conclusion to that scientific experiment is true and they have this data to support it. So even the most scientific and much less politics and social commentary, et cetera, et cetera, everything is a persuasion and therefore everything has assumptions. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a Pandora's box around assumptions, but in, in one of the reasons that people don't like to bring drama education in or drama or role playing or any actual interactive processes is that all of us assume we're going to act one way. <laughs> and we say, oh no, I'm really not prejudiced at all. Or I'm, I know I'm going to do this in this right. scenario. And if you keep it at the verbal level, and then you take it into the interaction level, mm -hmm. the gap is so great right. and nobody wants to go there. Right. Nobody wants to find make the jump from what I think I'm going to do in this situation and speak it to how you actually act. And I think this is a huge problem when it comes to forecasting and, and, and well, foresight, is that what we say and what we're going to do. Yeah, a friend of mine, a sociologist a long time ago, published a book called What We Say, What We Do, making that, that, yeah. that whole point. And the, uh, the, I'm forgetting the name of the guy who set up the, the prison experiments in the, mm -hmm. in the oh, 60s. Zimbardo. Yeah. Zimbardo. Right. Zimbardo, yeah. And, and, and it's Abu Ghraib, you know, 40 years ahead of time. If you put people in, a, in that type of situation without correct training, supervision, goals, et cetera, and rules, et cetera, and, and they turn into, you know, people that they never expected themselves to do. Flow uh, at the top, at the bottom there, you'll see the world and the trends and events and various kinds of things flow into the scenarios that have been the model. Uh, the little things are, are the uh, enterprise itself, what its mission uh, is, uh, what people expect it to be, their expectations, customer requirements, things like that. And then at the very top is the aspiration. One, one of the things you'll see later on when we talk about strategic planning is that the plan has to have both items from the world in other words, what is going on out there in bound change and the aspirations and the desires of people within the enterprise. You can't just make people do something because the world is forcing you to, but by the same token, you can't have every, every aspiration that you want because the world will establish some constraints. So we're talking about strategic planning, feeding in. And the plan, this the plan obviously is the centerpiece here. The plan is essentially goals, which are the end states that you're working for, measurable, achievable, particular, not necessarily short term. They could be five and ten years, but they need to be something you know where you're getting. The vision itself is quite uh, amorphous, can be motivating, but it's not necessarily measurable. The goals are measurable. And the strategies, as we use the term, are the means that you employ, the activities that you employ. In my organization, the big difference between what I see us doing and that is, that is the S on plans. Yes. It seems like the, the, what usually comes out is one plan. Are you advocating? No, that was just because I was 
Uh, not necessarily. But you talk about multiple futures. Should there be multiple plans to address <coughs> the futures? I mean, how do you connect the two? How do you make that? There are multiple in all the things. I don't think that counts multiple plans. Actually, at different levels, there should be every level ought to have its own strategic plan that fit within each other in some kind of nested sense if you have a hierarchical organization. So the business unit plan should fit within the corporate plan, et cetera, et cetera. So there are various plans at different levels, but there are always, there's generally one vision, but there are always more than one goal. There's always many, many oh, strategies, right. many measures, many initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. So the multiplicity is pretty well captured within one plan. I never saw the essay before. I, I guess I just don't see how that connects with multiple futures. If you're saying that there's alternative futures and you have to be ready for all of them, how can you Somehow that's got to fit into your planning <coughs> process. But well, or you have to be no. uh, at least cognizant. I mean, how do you how do you fit the two together? Okay, the scenarios go into the plan. The okay. trick is to balance a plan that does not assume one and only one future. Now, and that's a, that's a, okay, believe it or not, that's a kind of a new thought because everybody says, "Tell me the future, and then I'll make the plan." Well, gee, if I could tell you the future, a ten-year-old could make the plan. Wait a minute. <laughs> the real judgment involved is the ability to move forward on goals towards a vision, given the fact that you have multiple futures, which therefore means <laughs> that the plan usually ends up being more flexible, more robust more iterative and watching what's happening, monitoring that, so that when you move forward, you're taking your continually. So most people believe, okay, now the plan is done, we put it in the three refinery, and away we go. Now again, if you're going to build an oil refinery, that that's pretty close to what should happen, project management schedules, contractors, et cetera, et cetera. That is absolutely what can happen in strategic planning. This has to be a living document. The most you can plan are the initiatives, which I, I recommend not be more than a year out, maybe even less than that, and those are continually being revised and, 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 and continually steering according to it. So you can establish vision, goals, and strategies at the start, but you can't not stop planning just because you, you've done the plan. So most people think that it's a step, and then the next 10 years, all we have to do is run that plan. And that is not the way it works. It has to be more iterative than that. So that you handle multiple scenarios by taking that into account and then monitoring. There's another term that I use. I make a distinction between scanning, which is kind of the radar image, and monitoring. And you'll see a, a portion on here. I recommend that every scenario come with a set of leading indicators which are very specific events or, or variables that you can check with every quarter, every half a year, and say, where are we now? They're kind of like dials on the, on the dashboard. If this one's starting to trend this way, then we realize we're moving in that direction rather than the other. So the plan should have those kind of leading indicators, too. But you have to plan against multiple futures. You can't just pick one and say, well, 55% probability if that's going to happen, we're going to bank on that. Not the right, not the right attitude. So, planning against multiple futures is one of the big concept, one of the big takeaways. You can't plan against a single future. Good. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. And here's all the terms there. You can uh, do that. Okay. So, the purpose of forecasting. Let's talk about forecasting. But everybody wants to know is what's going to happen in the future. Well, of course. <laughs> Unfortunately, that you can know the futures, as we said, but the knowledge of that future state is not the most important thing when it comes to future studies. Getting the sense of the flow of change, you know, somebody mentioned dynamics. I mean, it's really the way things happen. And, and, and you know, in professional sports, for instance, or in military operations, or in sales campaigns, it's, you know, you can't just always say, here's what we're going to do next week and next week and next week. You have to kind of see what, what opportunities there are, where the threats are, where the obstacles are. And then, so, so, so forecasting is a way of practicing that <coughs> before you actually go out into the field. So it's, it's a simulation. It's a mental simulation. In fact, forecasting, one of somebody mentioned Herman Kahn, one of the founders of Futures Thinking, came out of the concept of nuclear warfare. Because the big difference between nuclear warfare and conventional warfare is that nuclear warfare was going to start and end within the course of two hours. And so you couldn't kind of sit down and sharpen your pencil and say, well, how are we going to respond if we see the missiles on the radar screen? We better run through. And that's where the red team, blue team, and 
all of that war gaming and all of that simulation came from. There was some of that beforehand, but it really took on an extremely important thing when, in fact, the engagement started and stopped almost immediately. And Khan at the Ray Corporation was involved in developing scenarios and simulations as a part of that. So they wouldn't know exactly what was going to happen. This was not a prediction. This was a sense of training people and getting them ready to handle various things that would happen, various contingencies. Same thing astronauts do, you know, preparing for a shuttle mission. I mean, if you have a perfect shuttle mission where none of the machines break and none of the indicators get off whack and none of the tiles are broken, et cetera, et cetera, somebody comes back and says, oh, isn't that stupid? We did all that training for nothing? No. We throw all this stuff, get the flow of the machine, see how the machine works, see how the mission works, how people work together, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the dynamics of change. Um, a little bit of that after an address rehearsal, you want everything to go wrong. <laughs> well, as you hold your dress rehearsal, everything is going to go wrong because you want to rehearse oh, yeah, everything yeah. falling sure. apart and you still get through. <laughs> and in theater, if you have a great dress rehearsal, you know you're holding it. It's valid. Speaking of laughter, I just did the, I just did the wrong thing. So. <laughs> the assumptions and the dynamics. Both we talk about assumptions. So scenarios are not just knowing what's going to happen in the future, but how things change and what the assumptions are we bring to it. Yeah, I just ask a question. What's the difference then between this and risk management? Uh, risk management, not, not, not as much as you would expect. Risk management, re <laughs> well, risk management, first of all, in risk management, you're focused on risk, mm -hmm. usually not so much on opportunity. Mm -hmm. and so there's, there's that. Mm -hmm. It tends to be very uh, physical or financial. These are contingencies. These are scenarios about you know, our, our investments, about our facilities, about security, things like that. So they tend to be very focused on fairly short-term discontinuities that would happen <coughs> if to prepare for contingencies. It's very close to emergency preparedness, which is, you know, hurricane forecasting, early responder stuff is all yeah. about the same thing, too. What's, what's amazing to me, and in fact, you know, and again, I've done some work in, in military intelligence organizations. This is exactly the thinking that commanders are trained over and over to do. What could go wrong? What could the surprise be? Where are we weak? Where are we vulnerable? And yet, you put them in a strategic role, what's the first thing they want? Give me the future and I'll make the plan. I mean, it, it, and, and maybe there's more, more contingent thinking at the strategic level than I give it credit for, but for the most part, when I talk to folks who, who are, are, are policy analysts or intelligence analysts or military planners, they say the customer always wants the specific future. Tell us what's going to happen, and then we will make the plan. And I say, well, you have to do what you have to do, but you should say, I'm sorry, that's not the best product that I can give you. We have to look at all the plausible alternatives. So that's becoming more aware now. It's certainly better than it was 10 years ago. But risk management is a very specific kind of contingency planning that is uh, emergency preparedness, very specific kind of contingency planning, similar to this. So that's our purpose. Uh, the mechanisms of change, as, you, uh, as I pointed out, this is a function of what we did before. Basically, trends are the continuous future, uh, and discontinuities are the events and the discontinuous disruptive future. Those both tend to relate to the world in terms of forecasting, and then, of course, we have choices. We make choices, we take actions, and the whole future is a combination of all three of those things simultaneously. If you focus on trends and constants, you get, there, was a, there was a very famous article in 1981 of Future Studies that laid out three kinds of futures, and I'll get through all three. This is the forecasting part, and it was the probable, possible, and preferable future. And there'll be a slide later on with all those three. I have, I, that was wonderful alliteration, <laughs> and I've modified that myself because it's not quite right. The probable future isn't really probable. In other words, for instance, if you take, if you roll dice, there are 12, 11, 11 different outcomes. And the most probable is? And the probability is? 50%. Ooh, way lower than 50%. One out of six. Hey. Hey, yeah. So, the, and this is, and I think Herman Kahn said this, but I can't verify it. The most likely future is. <laughs> I love that phrase. The most probable future is not probable, even in rolling dice. Now, that's a, with only 11 outcomes, the most probable future is not probable in politics or the economy or 
business or anything, the most probable future. And everybody says, give me the most likely estimate. Give me what's most likely to occur. Well, I can give you what's more likely than anything else, but there's a 97% chance that it's wrong. And that's why we do alternative futures. So when, I, when, when, when Roy Amara came up with probable, I like to use the word expected for the baseline future. I call it the baseline because it's where you start. It's where everybody else ends, frankly. Here's the future, stop it, okay, there's my product, give me my money, I'm done. We do that, and very futurists really deal with this. Uh, they, they like the uh, golly whiz bang stuff. In fact, there was a, a very famous scenario <coughs> project that came out of the Air War College in, in the 1990s called Air Force 2025, and they did a wonderful set of eight scenarios and with detail, it was a whole year project, all the students contributed to it, and they presented it to their customers, and they said, yeah, but what is most probable? So they basically had outlined the extremes, but they were required to go back in and basically do the baseline. Where, where are we headed? What's most probable? So this is the scientific part. This is the part that people feel most comfortable with in our scientifically oriented culture. It's where the data is most important. And we can use computers, and we can use math, and we can make this just about as complicated as we want to kind of increase our fees and stuff, but that's not the uh, the problem with the probable future, with the expected future, is of course that there's uncertainty. Everybody knows that, but they don't know what to do with it. What they really think is that, and this was, again, my scientific sociological background said, sooner or later, we'll have all the information and we'll have the right theories so we'll be able to predict exactly the way we can in physics and chemistry and to some extent biology and astronomy and everything else. Okay. The problem is there are inherent sources of uncertainty within human affairs and in some uh, affairs of, of some physical system that made that impossible. 1960s, even before that, we came up with the concept of chaos. Now, chaos is usually interpreted as disorder, as randomness, and it's not that at all. It's a very specific deterministic system which is also unpredictable. Theoretically, it's not, it's not complicated either. It can be a very simple system which can be chaotic, which means that after four or five iterations, we can't predict the outcome. And if that's true, in very simple system, again, in the more complicated systems that we're talking about the future, uh, very, very difficult. So there is no way, theoretically, of predicting the outcome of a, of a system which is exhibiting chaotic behavior. And so that, that's true. I mean, I can show that mathematically. Okay. Second thing is now the emergence of what we call self-organizing or agent-based systems, the Santa Fe Institute and its concept, because the systems thinking that we had done up till 1985 or 1990 was all what it was, the same version. It was a top-down macro thing where we kind of could put it in a computer simulation and we could run, we could run scenarios, but it was all pretty well behaved. Now we're looking at systems from the bottom up. We were looking at agent-based systems, which, gee, if you look at the economy, oh, there's a bunch of agents, like millions of them, buying and selling every single day. You look at the political system, oh, here we go again, millions of them voting and commenting and writing letters and blogging and all of this kind of stuff. So there we have our two most critical systems in all of society. You can characterize them with a causal model, like the tax rate if you want, but you can also characterize them as billions and billions of individual interactions. Forecasting the result of that, forecasting the price rate, forecasting a political revolution, forecasting whatever, generally impossible. And then finally, of course, we believe that we have some freedom. We believe that people have not yet made up their minds about what they're going to do in the future, and that is by definition unpredictable. And therefore. So even if you had the, the, you know, the Leibnizian, all the information in the world, and you had all these great theories involved, these three, these three reasons are that uncertainty is the dominant feature of the future in the long run. If you need more convincing, I'll call up wherever you want and tell them that. <laughs> what was your definition of chaos again? Chaos is a mathematical uh, a form that is deterministic but unpredictable. James Gleick basically wrote the book on chaos. Chaos is not random. It's not stochastic. It's a third kind of a behavior. So there's deterministic behavior, which is predictable. There's random behavior, like rolling dice and roulette wheels, whatever, which is unpredictable, but it is not deterministic. Chaos is deterministic. Each step is a mathematical function of the previous step. 
but it is not predictable in the, in the medium term. And weather is the best example for a chaotic system. That we, we have the equations, meteorologists have three equations and three variables. That are, they're like the Newtonian dynamics of weather, of, of atmospheric fluid motion. Yet those equations have, related, have behavior <coughs> such that after four or five iterations, they begin to diverge and you can't really know it. Why we can't know it the next week, we can know it tomorrow. And indeed, we can know it in the long run, perhaps as, a, as an accumulation, as a probability distribution, but we can't know it step by step. So that's an example of a natural system which is chaotic. We believe, we don't know, we believe in stock markets and, and polling places and, and economic transactions, markets in general. So, uncertainty dominance. Therefore, we come up with the second, and, 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 and Morris terms of the possible future. And I've already made that distinction. Possible future means that it's not impossible, that the probability of occurring is not 0%. But there are a lot of possible things that, frankly, we don't have the time for, and they kind of, you know, it's not worth really looking at. So I draw the distinction between the possible and the plausible. What could happen that could, when, when a person says, I don't think that's going to happen, but it could. That is, that's the touchstone. And that's where we then apply not just logic and, and math and, and extrapolation, where we apply the imagination and speculation. When we get into scenarios and stories and what Mimi's working on is dramatic representations or any kind of, actually a scenario presentation is different than just a paper saying, oh, this future could happen. Yeah. It's different than just a story. You've seen scenarios of stories and their characters and stuff, and that's a fine form of scenario. But anything that could have returned from the future is also a possible scenario. So we've had a video uh, interviews from people being videoed in the year 2020 as a scenario form of presentation. We've had a PowerPoint presentation presented to a board of directors in the year 2025. Assuming all that's happened between now and then, <coughs> and then looking forward, we've had uh, all kinds of different things. Okay. Now, I was given this once, and somebody raised their hand and said, how did you get those things back from the future? <laughs> oh, no. This is all fiction, sorry. But it's nice to think about a lot of imaginative. You could do pictures. You could do animations. You could do... Uh, you could do graphics, logos, anything that carries the essence of the scenario is a way to make it. Here's our picture of the future. We'll argue about whether the past is multiple or the future, but, but basically putting these two things together, we've got the baseline future, the expected future, where we're headed. If you draw a line through the past and the present, this is where we'll end up. But, and it has implications, impacting implications in terms of the future's will, is not something to, to discount. Most people, as I said, are talking about the trend, not the difference of what it's going to be like in the future. And even fewer people talk about the so what, what the implication is, what it's going to be like, what else it means, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely need to pay attention to the implications. But the real future is this cone. It's an expanding cone. The farther out it goes, the more there are, uh, more than there are. Now, that cone, the, the cross section of that cone, has an infinite number of points. You can't cover them all. So basically, your scenarios cover the major regions of that cone that you think is going on. I'm yeah. confused. Is the baseline the probable? Is it, yeah. is, is if we keep on acting the same way, yeah. that's where it's going to end up? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if things, business as usual. Yeah. Business as usual. The various terms, business as usual. The official future, sometimes it's okay. called. The expected future, sometimes it's called. Uh, any number of so it, and, and again my marine analogy is that if you draw a line through the center of the boat and you stay on that heading given all the winds and currents and whatever this is the point of land where you you land up I don't expect to be there but if I draw that line it's a theoretical point that's a good place to start because it, and it's a good place to start because frankly if anybody is thinking about the future at all that's where they think we're going to be they, they basically think of continuity continuous change, more computers, more older people, somewhat warmer temperatures, da 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 all the kind of trends <coughs> extracting it out in the future, it's a good place to start forecasting for ourselves and for our clients. The difference between future studies and the rest of the forecasters is we don't stop there. That's, that's, that's one point. Now, let's talk about a cone. And one of our jobs, frankly, is that most people are working with no cone at all or a fairly narrow cone. Why? Because of their assumptions. It is the assumptions that narrow the cone. It's their thinking, that can't happen. That's impossible. That's not likely. And we say, no, it's not likely. Of course, none of them are likely. 
But let's <coughs> challenge the assumptions and let's stretch the cone. So, and people are, the futurists oftentimes are uh, disappointed and discouraged on my clients and la 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 la. I take a teacher's view of it. If they, if they stretch a little bit, I'm happy. <laughs> so if they start out really narrow and they're not quite so little narrow, then that's what it is. So if, if, if students leave the class knowing more than they came in, hey, that's progress. They're not going to jump out and become plain futurists in one session or whatever. But think of what the assumption might Maybe what about the what if? And then go, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Bingo. That, that's the product. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, John. I'm assuming the baseline, you're not complying. It's a straight line. Well, it's very much what we talked about, the images. It's the road. It's the river. Yeah, some people see some, some curves and stuff in it. But frankly, it's pretty straight. It is the run line of the boat. It is extrapolating, and this is an image, it's extrapolating the future based upon where we are headed. If, as Mimi says, if things continue as they have been, this is where we'll end up in 2010, 2020, 2030. But, but if things as they have been is an increase in Oh, yeah, no, no, oh, yeah, no. So there's more computers, there's more. Yeah, it takes all those trends into account. Yes, trends are occurring. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could explain the past bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, we're not going to discuss it, but I will tell you that I put the past in there because I actually think you can make a case for multiple pasts. Uh, although we think of the past as a single thing, I again think that that's a pretty Western concept. It really was one thing. I mean, you know, how many fictional accounts are there of different people living what presumably was the same past and they see it as completely different? Certainly nationality, ethnicities. Uh, perspectives, genders, you said what? You know, <laughs> you know, all of that makes for at least different interpretation. I mean, what, what is the ontological past? I don't know if it's multiple or single because none of us know that. All we know is the past that we know. And, and the reason I say it's multiple is that we have revised our view of the past. I mean, when I was growing up, Christopher Columbus discovered America. Hey, you know, how, you know, how unpolitically correct can you get? And now it's, you know, the meeting of Europeans and native cultures, et cetera, et cetera. So, we, we, you know, so if we revise it once and then we maybe revise it again, revise it again, how many pasts do we have to have? So, so the pasts, I think, are kind of multiple. Not in the same way the futures are, but certainly our interpretations are. Yeah. Is saying history is written by the internet? Well, that's true. Yeah, sure. And, and our yeah. version of the past is not all the people's views, but of certain people. We get to write the textbooks. Okay, so that's a, that's a the picture of the future, and, and given long term, <coughs> certainly the futures are many, not one. Here's a here's a little lesson in language, and all you English majors there will remember mood. Mood is a form that a verb takes that connotes a certain degree of, of certainty. Really, the indicative mood is the is the, and the future tense of the indicative mood is that this will happen, this has to happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is very certain, it's very definite, it's very clear, it's very strong masculine, this is the way people are supposed to talk. If you can't say what will happen, don't say anything. We futurists say, no, you should say a lot, and you should not use an indicative mood, because you don't know what will happen. You don't know what should happen. So given the fact that we believe that uncertainty dominates in the long-term future, they might and could, though they're weaker, they don't sound as certain, they don't sound as strong, they are the more accurate way of describing the future. And the good thing about this language is that when you're in a group and people are allowed to say may, might, and could, then as long as it's plausible, different views of the future, different perspectives of the future are allowed to remain in the conversation and not be driven out by the one person who finally wins about their version of the future is the version of the future. So you can have a more creative, open kind of a dialogue then it trying to, I mean, most of it is about the future, is winning. Whose version of the future will turn out to be the right version, the version that everybody else finally agrees is the one. Usually they don't agree, but they give up. And that's disempowering, and it's disappointing, and it's discouraging. And really, as we talked about team dynamics before, if estimating the future is an ambiguous task, even if the person who wins is the best person, their view of the future will be less good than the collective judgment of all the people leaving different perspectives on the table at the same time. It is a much more, it's a much richer environment, whatever. The problem is that it's not strong. It's not definite. It's not certain. The only way you win in interpersonal competition is by pounding the table that much harder and winning the argument. You know? 
unfortunately, that's a habit that we have, and I think it militates against our using you know, using that kind of language the way we should. So, if you can make a recommendation for your own organizations, is allowing those that subjunctive mood to have a place in the conversation. Yes, I don't think it's going to happen. You're allowed to say, but what if it does? It may happen. Now, if you overuse it, if it's all the weird stuff in the world, then, then you will lose. So it really has to be substantial, plausible, and high impact you should be talking about, not just you know, a lot of other stuff. Yes? What I noticed from your past slides is the present, the attributes rather than the singular form. Uh, so that's, that should be a set of uh, assumptions. Should we have like parallel forms? We might even say that we were trying to, or you would just say the present is, is this. Do you see a point there? <laughs> Actually, I thought about that, and I put that nice and big because I covered up that. I don't know if the present singular. Or not. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. so I, I put that there, and I because I didn't know, and I didn't want it to be just that. So I made it. Yeah, exactly. You were assuming that it all came to a point, and it certainly looks like that. But there are multiple presents, just like the multiple presents. Excellent. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> Very few people see that. <laughs> Okay, so the scenario itself, uh, basically any representation, usually stories, papers sometimes, uh, but any representation of the future that carries the essence of it. And, and the purpose is, and I, and I understand, I underscored reality, because the way, what the impression you want to get is, wow, I really might have to live there. This is really different, and we might actually live there. And when people get that sense, they lose what I call the white knuckle of grip on the present, and on the expected future. Because they're thinking about the future too, they're awake, they, but, but what they'll tend to do is draw the baseline future, head it out there, and you say, that might happen instead. Oh my gosh, you're prepared for that. And it is very much like emergency preparedness, risk management, which is at a very low level, this is at a strategic kind of low level. So, uh, the, the scenarios are extremely important. This is, a, this is called a vulnerability chart. The vulnerability chart is usually written as a two by two, uh, impact on the on the probability on the, the middle uh, probability there thing is not there, but vulnerability analysis is called. You'll see it as high 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 low high low basis. So I, I do a little thing. Expected future, the baseline future is high impact. No, first of all, we're not dealing with low impact. Don't have time. Okay. High impact stuff. What what we expect to happen is highly probable, not necessarily probable, <laughs> quite likely. And then there's a term which we call the wild card. And that is a very high impact, but, but low probability future. So before 9-11, 9-11 was a wild card. We should have been considering it more, but it just kind of came to most of us right out of the blue, literally. And so, and then, and, and John Peterson, for instance, member of the World Future Society, head of the Auto Institute, has made his, his, his uh, career out of studying and talking about wild cards. His books are all about wild cards. So there is, there's a literature there. Of that. The real scenario, though, is in this moderate probability sense. It is not improbable, thing, and it's not probable. Thing. It's in between. And the reason that I point that out is that we are almost never trying to think about the in between. As I, 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 told, I was talking to a group of teachers two weeks ago, I said, "Now, tell me if this, this is not true. If you don't know the answer, don't raise your hand." Right? Well, if uncertainty dominates, you don't know the answer. And therefore, we generally don't say anything because, oh, I don't know, so therefore I'll keep my mouth shut. What we futurists say is, yes, you should say many things. Basically, what happens if it turns out one way? What happens if it turns out another? And you go down both of those paths, elaborating the causes, the implications, what we're going to do, et cetera, et cetera, in response to that. So the 50-50 thing, we really don't know what's going to happen, is the, is the, mo is the best scenario kind of thing. And so we, we urge uh, people to look at those things. It's 50 50, and it's a high impact, and that's the kind of stuff that, it, because your, your, your resources to develop scenarios is quite limited. You can't develop everything. So those are the ones, basically, that you use. This is an uh, interesting chart, uh, which is the relationship of probability and unpredictability, or predictability. I, gave this, I showed this chart to a group of actuaries. And you talk about really pointed head of it forecasters. These are the people who set the insurance premium rates and their technology and their mathematics. It's absolutely amazing. And I said, what's most probable? Is it highly unpredictable, highly predictable, or highly unpredictable? 
And they said, oh, the most probable is the highly predictable. And I said, what about the most improbable? Oh, that's not predictable. What do you mean the probability? The predictability is that 90% of the time, the, uh, the improbable won't happen. That the unpredictability is right there at the middle. That's where the scenarios need to be. Moderately probable. And that's the area that, frankly, we are told to stay away from in school, in work, in places like that. We are not really ever encouraged to talk about that because we don't have a nice, definitive, clearly declarative, indicative way of talking about that. It all has to be in terms of what might happen, what might not happen. In so I love, I love when every time I can stump an actuary out of the <laughs> So this is this is the this is the sum total of how we go about forecasting, and there's a whole course underneath it. But uh, basically, the various information sources. You see, uh, I've, I've drawn a distinction here between research and scanning. In my lexicon, research is the process of gathering information to do a forecast. Standard kind of social science, usually secondary research. You can do primary research, which is uh, surveys, interviews, what people expect, and things like that. But uh, that's that. And that the result of that is from texts, experts, organizations, and things like that. Then at the bottom is scanning. And scanning is once, you're, once your research is done, once you've done the forecast, hey, guess what? The future doesn't stop. Change doesn't stop. You need to keep in touch with that. And I talked about monitoring. We'll talk about that in a second. But you need to keep that guy on the top of the mast looking out for other kinds of change. And in that sense, uh, the websites, periodicals, and that. The very first step after that, at gathering information, is to take a very brief little look at history. This is, I mean, when students do this, they start back at the, at the Sumerian civilization. Whoa, you know, don't do a timeline. When was the last time, when did the current era begin? That's the question I ask. When was the last significant discontinuity? We were talking about education, the era of education. The era of education basically started in the 1960s and early 70s with Sputnik and in the U.S. at least, and Sputnik and the mass education and all of that. There is a, there's an era going on right now of accountability in public education, but higher education is pretty well started at that particular time, and it's been pretty much the same ever since. What was the difference before, and what is the difference now? Period. That, but, but that gives that gives us an historical context for how we are thinking of ourselves and putting ourselves into history. So there is a history. Current conditions, this is a this is kind of an endless process. You can describe the present. And notice that those are the steep categories. You can describe the present a lot. The stakeholders are part of the present. People involved, remember the, there's, there's the variables, and there is the stakeholders, who's involved, what are their influences, what are their interests, what are they doing, they change the future. But once, so this is basically what I call a snapshot. This is the picture of the future. This is as it is today. Then we put the snapshot into motion, it's like freeze frame, and then we start it going, and forces of change. And there are two kinds of forces of change. One kind, like trends, lead to the baseline future. So a few other things do too. But fundamentally, it's trends. More computers, older people, blah, 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 more terrorism, all that kind of, all those kind of trends that people talk about. The other aspects, forces of change, events, how might they happen, maybe not. Issues, how do they get resolved? Do they you know, have immigration or, you know, or not? And new ideas, that's really kind of a residual category for all the crazy stuff that people propose that might actually, you know, somebody might actually pick it up. That then produces uncertainties, which then are the uh, source of alternative. So the baseline stuff, and then the alternative stuff. And as I mentioned, for every alternative future, there should be a set of leading indicators. There should be a set of variables that you kind of tell you know, spring is on the way. You know, the robins come, and that's a leading indicator, you know, or whatever, uh, that, that kind of thing. That's the forecast. Uh, the forecast leads to impacts and implications, which is like on the, on the chart, and then, of course, response. Now, all of that, that, that last one is the action part. What are we going to do? How are we going to achieve our goal? Achieve our mission, et cetera, et cetera. That's the planning side. This is a framework for forecasting, not planning. Okay, so let's turn, turn to the other, the third future then, the preferable future. That one I leave the same. 
<laughs> preferable future is the, is the result of choice, it's the result of your actions, it's the outbound future, and there we see a whole bunch of different techniques and thinking and forces involved. Uh, it is the visionary future, the aspirational future. Futurists tend to place more emphasis on this than most other people who do regular management consulting. We really want to empower people. We want to give them a sense that they have more influence over their future than they realize. And certainly more influence than forecasters will tell them. Say, oh, this is, this is your future. Deal with it. That's about it. But we say it's probably, again, in the long run, you have more influence than you realize. And that's the, now, you can't have any future you want. And the future that you will get is a combination of what you do and what they do, or what the world does. So it's always that mixture. So watching what they're doing, and indeed getting in, getting in step with them, is a, is a great strategy. Uh, uh, John Nesbitt, a celebrity futurist in the 1980s, said it's always easier to ride a horse in the direction it wants to go. And so uh, you, you, if you're going to create change, figure out where everybody's running to and tap into that energy and move in that direction. Now, that doesn't mean we want to be unethical or terroristic or anything like that, but, but where people's changes are, where the, move, where the momentum is, there's huge momentum out there in the world moving towards a particular place. Align your aspirations with that, and you get free energy, basically. You're, getting, you're not having to push against the wind. You're actually kind of using So that's a no. There's a vision of vision. Uh, it's on the border of plausible or not plausible. Vision is a very uh, uh, amorphous kind of a concept. It is absolutely crucial for creating transformational change. But whether it's... Um, it's plausible or not, it needs to be like kind of the tweetish. Uh, it needs it, it can't be ridiculous, let's put it that way. What I call it barely feasible. It's a future which just could happen if we if everything breaks right, if we're really good, that's where we'll that's where we'll head. We'll, 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 we'll Leadership is the beginning of discussion of vision. Um, but uh, and our concept of leadership in future studies is different than most people's. Most people in English, at least, leaders are those who are in charge of something. Bosses, CEOs, generals, et cetera, et cetera. In my own terminology, I call them authorities. They're appointed to make binding decisions. So you're hired, you're hired. There's a budget, the budget. You're fired, you're fired. Plan, plan, et cetera, et cetera. They are not necessarily leaders because they are not necessarily promoting visions. They are not necessarily promoting transformational change. So, therefore, a person who wants to be a leader, anybody can be a leader if they're promoting transformational change. Now, they could be promoting world peace, more power to them. It is better to promote transformational change among some place where they have some influence. So, their job, their, their colleagues, their community, whatever. That's hard enough. Because, but at least they have some chance of creating. So, uh, there are uh, any number of, I like to rescue the term visionary. Um, in the 1980s, that was just a visionary. <laughs> it's kind of one word, just a visionary. And so someone who commits uh, to achieve something of significance. So it's a commitment. It's, a, it's an accomplishment. And it's something significant. My, I have actually two examples. I'll give you my traditional example for a visionary. It was a guy named Bruce Renfro. I heard on NPR. I heard two, two reports on him. He, wrote, he drove an elevator in the New York State subway system. Union Square Station. From the street to the subway and back up and down. One of the elevator operator. He transformed that elevator into a magical experience for the people who wrote the elevator. He hung pictures in the elevator. He, made, he got a little boom box and played music. He introduced himself, introduced people to each other. I mean, these are people in Manhattan, New York, going to work. I mean, you talk about a tough crowd, right? <laughs> people were saying it was the best 20 seconds of their day. He took that elevator and made it committed to achieve something of significance. And people would then come home from work, having a tough day in New York, and all that kind of thing. He also had Captain Well, he also did. <laughs> well, that was his advantage, one of his advantages. But how, you know, that took imagination, commitment, et cetera, et cetera. So if Bruce Renfro can transform his world, yeah, come on, which one? You know, you can all probably see. 
So that's what a visionary is. There are a hundred definitions of leadership. Leadership has probably been discussed and studied more than anything in all of social science. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but I believe it is. And there are any number of theories, et cetera, et cetera, of leadership, most of which I'm not going to go into. My, uh, uh, the two, my two most favorite. Uh, the third one is uh, one of my students said, I said it once, I don't remember, but I'll take credit for it. Help people build a bridge when they only know one side of the river. Why are we going through this? Because there is this visionary side. Well, do you know where to know? Do you have any data? No. Do you, are you guaranteed we'll get there? No. Well, how stupid am I to, you know, to sign on to that? Right? But that's leadership. It's enrolling people. In it motivates people to do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they do want to achieve. That's the things get worse before it gets better. They don't want to change goals. They don't want to have to learn something new. They don't want to have to give up stuff but they do want to achieve the vision in the future, so sooner or later goes away. Right. The vision is, um, I, I hear that, of course, from George Bush Sr. His uh, vision thing is a little bit different. Uh, and uh, there's any number of things uh, we should talk about there. It's an image. It's uh, old and ambitious, yet plausible. And if possible, it ought to be unique. If we don't do it, no one will. If we, if we don't, if this is our compulsion, mission, we have to be able to achieve this, uh, this vision. I don't have a choice. So I think real leaders are really compelled. They are propelled to their visions. I don't know that they, they choose them. Uh, there's a uh, famous phrase from one of the leaders in Houston who set up a whole new future study center in Houston. says, we, well, he's actually uh, quoting from... Uh, <coughs> Who's Gardner? What's Gardner? The big Howard. 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 No, not no. There's the other Gardner. John. John Gardner. John Gardner. Yes. Yeah, we are the people we've been waiting for. <laughs> we are the people we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for somebody to lead us out of the desert into the promised land. Well, we are the people. There is no doubt. So the uh, vision is extremely important. These are historical, religious, political visions. Uh, history, uh, politics, and religion are full of visionary kind of stuff. You can talk about visionary in business, and education, and all that too. Uh, uh, each of these, I think, uh, fulfills the characteristics that, uh, that we're looking for. Okay. Planning then, once the vision or, or, or the vision is in development, planning is about mobilizing resources. It's about getting people together to say, not what's the most complete technical plan. This is the last the last question on the, on the quiz. What's our direction? Do we understand what that means? Are you committed to do your part? If either or any of those three things are not there, then the strategic plan is not going to be successful. And the change management is not going to be successful. So there has to be a clear direction. There has to be an understanding of what that direction is on the part of all the critical players. And there has to be a commitment. Because a lot of people will kind of wait and see. And that's a very, I don't know if it's true in all cultures, it's a very American thing. The boss says, this is our bill. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. And three weeks from now, undermine, 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 tear apart, tear apart, yes, but, yes, but, and the implementation is a disaster. And so, that, those are the things are I mentioned that the plan itself is the combination of your forecasting, what's happening in the world, and the aspirations of the people and the stakeholders involved in things. So it has to be both. It shouldn't be just the world makes us do this. That's not going to work. And this is what we want to do, irrespective of what the world is telling us. That's not going to work either. It has to be. A mission statement uh, is one of the crucial things. The mission, of course, is what the enterprise is. And uh, that is a particular model that I've used for so this. It's a customer-oriented model even for non-businesses. It's a customer. And that customer has needs. The enterprise provides services and products to satisfy and fulfill those needs for which it gets benefit, and there are other folks involved. When you have, when you use this model, when I do strategic planning facilitation, it's basically fill in the blank. Now, that's not the brochure copy, but that is the fundamental. Who's your customer? Who are you really here for? Who are you serving? It could be, it doesn't have to be a customer, it could be students, it could be poor people, it could be sick people, whatever. Who's your customer? Who are you here for? What do they need? What do you do? What usually people happens is what they need is what we provide. Well, students need instruction. No, they don't need instruction. They need knowledge. 
He needs skill. Maybe instruction's the way to do it, maybe not. The best way I heard put that is that there are four million power drills sold in the United States every year, and not one of them is needed. <laughs> what do people need? The hole. The hole. <laughs> they need the hole. The drill is the means to the hole. So people generally associate what they need us. No, they don't need you. You need to you you are fulfilling their needs by doing something. Is that the right thing or not? And that's a great discussion to have with an enterprise which has believed that they're they're absolutely necessary and going on. So it's a boilerplate. The rest of the plan then begins with the mission. And my definition of a mission is a territory. This is an area of the world that we have staked out and we are going to work within. It's not set in stone, but it should be there, should be explicit. So our mission is, my mission uh, in future studies is to prepare foresight professionals for work in the countries around the world. That's my mission. And, and, I'm, and everything I do is about trying to make that happen. Um, vision then is how well I can do that is the be very best way that I could fulfill that mission in my most aspirational moment. Goals then flow from that. Goals are achievable. Strat uh, measures for those goals that need to be measured. Strategies then are the means that I use to achieve the goals. And then finally, the initiatives. Notice that the initiatives are below the line. Those are short-term, basically, projects or plans that we're going to do. That's where the planning comes in. That's where the budgets are. That's where the teams are. That's where the responsible people are. All the rest is fairly general, long-term, looking out way down all the things that horizon. And then you go to implement the plan. And this is the most, one of the most important charts here. This is people's reaction to your proposal of creating transformational change. This is you when you first started your career. You were clueless. You were in the valley of confusion. But you, you learn, you, you experimented, you went to school, you studied, you listened, you tried, and you finally achieved something which was great. You got the promotion, published the book, made something that was, oh, yes, won the championship, whatever it is. And after that, you retired to what I call the plateau performance. Now you're good, you're a veteran. You know how to do this job. You work hard, you put in your time, you earn your money, there's nothing, there's nothing bad about this, and you're going along, going along, using the skills and competencies which you've created over 10, 20 years of experience, and somebody comes along with transformational change, what are they asking you to do? Go back to the value. What you, I don't know how to do that. And I've been, I've been, and literally, my performance level, I'm talking like that person, will decline if we do this. Yes. The performance level of the whole enterprise will decline if we do this. Yes. Should we do this? Is this is that an investment? Is it the time to make the investment to cross the gap from the old era to the new era? So the fact that people don't like you when you propose transformational change is not that they're bad people or they're just resisting change. They're saying, whoa, you know, I kind of like my life the way it is. Thank you very much. Stop messing with it, will you? Now, the longer that goes on, the more danger there is that the world will come in and make them into the valley of confusion by doing away with the enterprise completely. That's really what happened in the Soviet Union. So the Union, we didn't have to shoot at them. We didn't have to drop bombs on them. They put themselves out of business by not changing 20 years before they should have. And finally, there was literally nothing left, and the whole thing seemed to collapse. So that's the ultimate danger of not uh, Elizabeth Cooper Ross, you're familiar with the stages of grief. Yeah. And this is exactly what happens when people go through transformational change. We don't need to do this. They may have to. That's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen in my organization. We're not going to make that happen. And then, of course, they realize it's going to. And the anger starts. How dare they? I put in my good news with this company. I've done this. I've done that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, be angry. It's time to change the world. It's time to change things. Be angry. And then comes the bargain. This is my favorite thing. Okay, all right. So you put the computer on my desk. Do I have to turn it on? What, what, I mean, how far? What, you know, and then it's, okay, I'll do exactly what you tell me. No, 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 no. doesn't work for you. And then the depression. This is not okay. And this is where the grieving process is. This is the loss. The loss of the good old days. And they were good old days. One, t one mistake people make in creating change is that they criticize the past. Don't criticize the past. The enterprise is still alive. If you're doing this, then you have to be successful at doing something. 
It's just that it's gotten to be obsolete and outmoded. It's not bad. It was fine. But we can't continue to live in the future that way. So we let people have that loss. And then in Elizabeth Google Ross, and she was dealing with terminally ill patients, I hope transformational change is not quite that big. But she would talk about acceptance. I actually think it's more like exhilaration. That, that person says, you know, we should have done this a long time ago. And you don't say it, but in the back of your mind, it's, well, if you weren't so, we would have done that. <laughs> right? You know, so if, if, if people hadn't done that. So it's that, it, it finally there is that vision. Now, is that guaranteed to happen? No. And they are right. You could lose without gain. You could lose the investment. And that's a realistic possibility. So my, my recommendation is do not start this process. This is like, you know, the commercials, don't do this at home. You know, don't do this, professional drivers on a closed course kind of thing in the ads. Don't do this until you're prepared to live with the scope of what it is. So start small things. Try to get the experience. Get more people involved. You know, because they are making a decision. What's the, what's, what's the use? What's the benefit? What's the cost? What's the benefit? Now, what you will find, we're all familiar with do is another S-curve, which is the, the, the diffusion of innovation. You all heard of Everett Rogers and the, the innovators and the early adopters. And this is exactly true here. There are a few people who will respond to your idea or anybody's idea about transformational change right off the bat. Oh, yeah, let's do it. And you think you're there. You're not even close. And they have to start convincing other people, and those people have to convince other people until you get a critical mass that can actually create the change. The leader's job, only his job, is to recruit and maintain people enrolled in the campaign for change. The leader doesn't have to do anything except get people involved and keep them involved while the going gets tough. And that, frankly, is the hardest job of all. That's a tough job too. But, so other people will run out and do great things. And they'll go out and do great things. Let them go do great things as long as they're enrolled in the process. So my four things I, I've already talked about. There needs to be, this is, this is before the four things, there needs to be, therefore, to convince people. I believe that people <coughs> fundamentally want to do a good job. They like what they're doing. And that um, uh, they would like to see the transformation change. But there needs to be some benefit. They're going to give something up. And, that, and you can't just not do that. The vision, the commitment, communication, and the trust, we talked about that already. And even though I'm a left liberal uh, 1960s sociologist, it does need to be for me. <laughs> I mean, I wish change erupted from the people. <laughs> Somebody has to raise their hand, first of all, and say, we can do this better. <laughs> now, they may get an instantaneous response. Everybody says, huzzah, that's great. That hardly ever. Get a few people who will say, yeah, it's a good idea. Let's try to see what we can do. And then the hard part, this is an enrollment process. It's a campaign of persuasion. And it's leader and change. 